QuickBooks Desktop 2023, Company Preferences, Accounting. Let's do it with Intuit, QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop. If you've been following along, we set up the Get Great Guitars, which I misspelled and will fix shortly in the prior presentation, a new company file, our practice file. If you don't have this company file, that's okay. You could follow along with another company file because we are in essence, just simply gonna be going through the preferences down here. The thing that's great about having a new company file to look through those preferences is you can see what the general default preferences are and then determine when you would need to change those default preferences if you were to set up a new company file. If you're working with a company file that has already been set up, then it's quite possible those preferences have already been changed from the default preferences. So first, let's, let's change the spelling up top here. So you probably, if you did watch the prior presentation, were like, hey, you misspelled guitars. Okay, so I'm gonna go into my company, company, and then my company. And then we've got our information up top that I would like to change. So I'm gonna say edit that information. And I think I just need to change that to an A. So if I misspell anything, I apologize. It's not my, not my strong suit, the, spelling, the spelling thing, the whole spelling thing. Let's go ahead and make this uh, maximize to the gray area as typically is our custom. Now note that when you first set up the company file, some of the preferences will be set automatically depending on the choices that you use, such as the company type. And you'll have some things that will be set up, such as if we go to the list drop down, the chart of accounts, we could see that we have a chart of accounts that has already been populated based on the type of industry that we chose. And we chose a particular industry that's gonna use inventory. So we've got the cost of goods sold, accounts down below note what it did not even though we have these cost of goods sold accounts if i close this back out it didn't add the inventory line item so it doesn't add the item for us tracking inventory that's one of the things we'll have to change so now we're going to go into the edit drop down up top and look through the preferences now there's a whole lot of preferences and many of the default preferences will be fine so we've got all these categories on the left hand side for the company preferences and then in each category we typically have two tabs up top my preferences and company preferences we're going to go through each one of these in some detail to get an idea of, of the things that are included in them and when you might be changing some of the key components of these preferences which of these preferences might be by default uh, and may need changing and so on. So I'm gonna start up top with the accounting up top, of course. Where are we gonna start? At the beginning, at the beginning with the most important stuff, the accounting stuff, of course. So we got the My Preferences tab and then the Company Preferences tab. Now, before I go too much further, just remember that I have increased the size of the screen again, which is something that you could find in the preferences here, but typically it's a Windows setting. So you could, I mean, you could go to like the desktop view, uh, not the desktop view, you could go to, yeah, it is the desktop view and then to My Preferences and the display settings. But really you're just opening up your Windows settings if you're using a Windows computer, which is what I have experience with and then within your settings you go to the display options and then i've got the screen i'm working on that i've increased to 150 so that it's a bit more zoomed in so if you're looking at your screen saying hey it's a bit smaller over here you can zoom that in okay back to the accounting company preferences so we've got this is going to be checked off by de default will typically be what you want here this one over here use account numbers that's going to be an important component that could be quite useful to be having account numbers, but it's not on by default because the account numbers can be confusing. So just, just do a quick recap of that here. I think we have a whole course on how to use account numbers if you want to turn them on, but to understand them, 
Let's go to the lists drop down chart of accounts. You can see they populated the chart of accounts here. Now, if there's no account numbers, you might think, well, the chart of accounts should be in order by name. But no, it's not in order by name. It's in order by type of account. It's in order of balance sheet accounts, then income statement or profit and loss accounts and further broken out into cash accounts receivable, fixed assets, and then equity type of accounts, income, cost of goods sold and expense accounts. So if you add account numbers, then you can have a little bit more control, especially within each category. So for example, the expenses down here uh, are then going to be in alphabetical order after order by class, by type. So, so you could then, if you don't want advertising to be the first one, you can have a different account number and so on. And that can help you to group certain accounts together. Possibly you've got, you've got like an automobile and then you've got fuel, possibly you got repairs and stuff and you want to group them together. Account numbers can help with that. Although you can also do that kind of thing with sub accounts that we'll talk about later as well. So they can be a useful tool. The problem with account numbers is that you have to add an account number and think about where the account number should be every time you put an account number in place. And if you mis uh, misallocate an account number and you have it out of order, let's say you, you make the asset account uh, uh, 1000 and you make the the expense account 500 or something, it's, it's, it's going to be out of order in terms of the numbering because it's first going to be in numbered by the type. So that's what you got to keep aware of first. And then you also have to make sure that you're leaving space between the account numbers so that if I wanted to add another account number between these two accounts, for example, I don't want to limit myself by having the account numbers that I chose right next to each other. This is number one, this is number two. Well, what am I going to do? Make a 1.5 in the middle? So you got to kind of think about those things when you're setting up the account numbers. So you probably want like five digit account numbers or at least four digit account numbers that are at least, you know, 10 numbers spaced apart, more like like 100 spaced apart if you could at least so that you can have a whole lot of space in the middle in the case that you want to add more accounts in the, in the future. Okay, so if you were to turn them on, let's just see what it looks like. If I go into the edit preferences and say, I'm going to turn my account numbers on and say, okay, now they've got the account numbers. Now notice that they added like kind of a default account system for numbers, meaning they got five digit numbers. Notice they're well spaced, even within the same category of fixed assets here. So there's a lot of room in between them. And then the liabilities start with a two instead of a one. Equity starts with a three, still a five digit number. Sales starts with a four and then cost of goods sold five and automobile six. That's the general idea of it. And then even with the expenses, you can see there's a lot of space in between each of them so that whenever you add a new account, you shouldn't run into any problems and that the account numbers are going to restrict you. The account numbers should give you more control, not limit your control over the orderings of your accounts. Okay, let's turn that back off though. We're not going to use account numbers for our practice problem. We'll turn them off, which is the default. Then you've got the use class tracking for transactions. This is a specialty area that could be used for multiple different things. You might use it, for example, in a job cost type of system and it will basically allow you to give you uh, uh, the income statement or profit and loss in, in a class by class calculation. So to do that, you would have to assign a class to each transaction. You also could use it if you're using the same uh, QuickBooks file for personal and business uses, then you might try to assign all of your expenses to either personal or business, and you can generate a business, uh, an income statement for both personal and business and then the total uh, as well. So we won't go into that in detail because again, it's an, a specialty area. It might be used in, in not-for-profit organizations and stuff as well. So there's a lot of different applications for it. But just to get an idea of it, every transaction you enter, so if I was to enter like an invoice, notice I have a pretty simple invoice entry. I don't have any class field here. If I turn on the classes and I go to the edit preferences, company file and turn on the classes prompt uh, to assign classes that's going to be a, 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 a thing that's going to say hey you didn't assign a class so here now we have a class field that we have to enter and we have to assign a class every transaction so that the system can know which column to put it in place if I ran a profit and loss by class notice also 
that the classes are usually first thought of as something that can break out the income statement or profit and loss on a class by class basis. Uh, uh, and if you have a more advanced version of QuickBooks uh, desktop, then you can also do it with a balance sheet, breaking the balance sheet out by class. But that gets complicated to break out the balance sheet by class because you get into issues with the balance sheet balancing and so on and so forth. So typically you're thinking income statement broken out in a class by class situation. When might that be useful? Okay, I'm gonna turn that back off. Edit drop down classes. We're not, we have courses on classes for different uses in and of themselves, like job costs, not for profit courses, courses where you do personal, use the QuickBooks for your personal and business if you have a small business. So you can take a look at those if you so choose. Automatically assign general journal entry numbers. So when we make a journal entry, notice that when we enter data into the system, we're typically gonna be using the forms. So the general idea of the accounting system will be, we've got the underlying foundational stuff in place so that we can do the data input as easily as possible with data input forms, possibly making it easily easy enough so I can assign someone or hire someone that doesn't understand the setup process or the end result financial statements, how forms impact them can still do the data input. So the underlying stuff are things like the chart of accounts that we want to have set up, then the items that we'll have set up, which we'll talk about as we go in the future so that we can create invoices and these kind of things as easily as possible. These kind of things will create the financial transactions, which include for a double entry accounting system, journal entries every every form is going to have an impact on at least two accounts impacting the balance sheet and the income statement in such a way that it remains in balance assets equal liabilities plus uh, equity that's going to be the general idea now if you have an accounting background you might try to think of things not as a as a form but you might think about things in just terms of journal entries so you might say, why don't I just enter a journal entry for each time I enter a transaction? You don't want to do that because the forms do other things other than just enter the journal entry, such as tracking the invoice, tying the invoice to the receive payment. So the general idea is that you want to first think, is there a form that is designed to use and use that typically? If not, then I default to a journal entry. So a journal entry would just be going to like a company dropdown. And if I say, I want to make a journal entry, so now I've just got my debits and credits here, debit credit, and I can enter things directly as a debit and credit instead of using a form. And then you can have the journal entries being assigned a number and they're pre-assigned a number. And that's what that setting is doing. It's pre-assigned in the number. So typically we'll keep that on by default. Edit preferences, what else we got in here? Warned when posting a transaction to retained earnings. The retained earnings, uh, is and this this is the account that basically we use for the income statement to roll into the balance sheet. So it's kind of a, a really important account. Notice that you might call retained earnings something different depending on the type of company that you are in. So if you're in a sole proprietorship, you might just call it owner's equity account or the capital account. If it's a partnership, then you've got kind of two partnerships, the two partners or more that you have to deal with that have capital accounts and the rollover process becomes more complex because you're gonna have to then assign to the partners in accordance to their partnership agreement but you've got the same kind of general process of the income statement rolling into the balance sheet. And then for a corporation, that's when it's called retained earnings, meaning it's the income that the company has generated that they have not given back to the owners in the form of dividends. In the form, if it was a sole proprietorship, it would be the income that the sole proprietor business has generated that has not been given back to the owner in the form of just draws. Same for basically a partnership. So. The thing is that normally you don't post something to the retained earnings account. So, so it's going to give you a warning when you do so. And so you could just give yourself a check, a, a second reminder of like, do I really want to post something to retained earnings? So we'll leave that on for now. Although when we set up the company file, we will need to do some posting to the retained earnings and we'll see that warning pop up. And then it says warn if transactions are 90 days in the past, warn if transactions are 30 days in the future. These are usually really good warnings if you're working real time. If you're working in an accounting department and you're entering transactions each day, you know, as transactions happen, then these are great warnings. If on the other hand, you're a bookkeeper or something like that, 
and someone comes to you and says, hey, I need you to do a whole year's worth of data input into, into QuickBooks so that I can do my taxes, uh, then you can have a whole lot of transactions that are gonna be 90 days past in the past. If you're working on a practice problem that's somehow in the future for whatever reason, then you might have uh, transactions in the future. So this is generally a really good internal control and you might even wanna limit it more than 90 days to like 30 days if you're working real time. If you're doing a whole year's worth of data input so that someone can get their taxes done or something, then you're gonna to wanna to turn these off. Otherwise, every time you enter a transaction, it's gonna give you a warning. We are working a practice problem. So I'm gonna take it off here just in case you're working in a different time frame than I am. And, I'm, and because we're working not real time necessarily, I'll take it off. Uh, so then we've got a date through which books are closed. So you could set the closing dates. Now this is a standard kind of thing for managing your your accounting. So if you're working in like an accounting department, then it's it's nice to be able to say, okay, we've closed this period, this month or this year, for example. And if you do anything to the prior month or year, we, we need to be, I'm gonna click on it. We need to be quite careful. So, and this becomes, you can see this on a year by year basis quite uh, clearly because for example, if in 2000, let's say last year, 2021, you created your balance sheet and your income statement, you use that to create your taxes based on that. And then in 2022, you made a change to the prior year data. A common change might be you voided a check. You had a check that never cleared. You had to void the check. If you void the check, just as of the prior period, it's gonna remove the expense account that was on the income statement, which lowered net income, which then rolled into the balance sheet and the equity side of things. Now that's a problem because you already recorded, you already finalized last year, you already made your tax return based on last year, and that's gonna mess things up. What you really wanna do then is basically make that adjustment, that change in the current year so that you don't mess up the prior year. Now, oftentimes small businesses get this kind of messed up a lot because they're trying to fix certain things as they go forward, like accounts receivable gets out of whack or they, they don't know what's going on with undeposited funds or they've got these checks that are outstanding that haven't cleared and then we start deleting stuff and then the retained earnings gets gets messed up. And sometimes it doesn't even get caught. So your taxes are, are a little kind of wonky because now you got these timing differences that might not be in, accounted for properly because when you do the tax return it, it only looks at the income statement if you're sole proprietorship because you're doing a schedule c but if you were to do taxes for like a corporation and have the balance sheet and the income statement then the problem would be you'd see the problem because the retained earnings wouldn't roll over properly from the prior year to the current year and that's when you can clearly see the problem so if you're doing taxes for at the end of the year for like a business that needs to record the the balance sheet for the taxes you're going to end up with situations where the prior year retained earnings doesn't match up to the current year retained earnings that's probably because they adjusted something in the prior period so larger companies get better and better at this and they basically do so by kind of restricting their accounting staff from posting stuff to the prior period because it messes stuff up and they can get quite quite uh, <laughs> agitated you know and and uh, controlling in this regard because it does cause kind of problems so in any case to keep your financial data secure quickbooks rec uh, recommends assigning all other users their own username and password in company uh, set up users so if you got multiple people working in quickbooks you can have the different people set up their users and you can set up their settings differently and as you get a larger company then assigning different users to have their own tasks and their own capacities in terms of what they can do in the softwares and limits to those capacities is what we call separation or segregation of duties. It's a huge internal control, which allows hopefully the reduction of errors and things like that. So QuickBooks will display a warning or require a password when saving transactions dated on or before the closing date. So you can see more details here. Uh, you got the checkbox, exclude estimates, sales orders, and purchase orders from closing date restrictions, which you could turn on or off. 
and then you've got the closing date that you can set here. QuickBooks strongly recommends setting a password to protect transactions dated on or before the closing date. So if, you're, if you have multiple people working in the software, you can turn on these restrictions and hopefully at least give a warning to people if they're trying to post something to a prior presentation and restrict people from doing that. If you're working on your own in the software, then you might wanna do it for yourself just to have you give a warning to yourself uh, or, I mean, just be mindful that if you delete something in a prior period, it causes a problem. Generally, QuickBooks is, if you don't turn this on, QuickBooks is very forgiving in terms of deleting transactions and stuff like that, uh, which isn't usually what you wanna do from a full accounting perspective. You usually wanna keep the transactions you entered and then enter something into the future to give yourself an audit trail of what has happened in the past and how you've you fixed it and why you fixed it with memos and whatnot going forward. But sometimes that flexibility can be the easiest way to fix things, So, you, but you just have to be careful. And we'll talk about that as we do the data input. So that's main stuff in the accounting area. We'll go on to each one of these in future presentations in some detail.